Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, IBC meeting. Uh, my name is Bob Allen. I'm the chair of the IBC. Uh, I am joined by three vice chairs, Harsha Sandra Takar, Robert Lane, and Chris Larry. Um, and for those newcomers to the group, I'd certainly like to welcome you and let you know that the International, uh, the Intelligent Building Council, what we do is we work to strengthen the large building automation industry through innovation, uh, technology-focused research projects. This was established back in 2001. Uh, IBC reviews market opportunities, takes strategic action and monitors initiatives and relate, relates them to integrated systems and automations in the large building sector. This council uh, projects and promotes the next generation of intelligent building technologies and incorporates a holistic approach that optimizes building performance and savings. So welcome to those who have been here before and welcome to any newcomers that we have. Uh, Greg, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here, Bob. Yeah. Hey, Greg, how are you? Good, good, you? Good, good, you wanna kick us off with the agenda? Yeah. Yeah, so here's here's the we have a sort of a relatively packed agenda today. So we'll we start off here with the agenda, and then uh, a, a call to order, welcome, and introductions. A little bit about the uh, the IBC, some some administrative work where we uh, review some of the past minutes, and uh, and I'll talk about uh, uh, a call for for board members. We will do a, a research update, some of the work that the IBC has been doing in uh, intelligent building. Buildings research through CABA, and then uh, we'll have a, a keynote presentation from interpreting and leveraging indoor air quality data in the connected building, and this is from uh, from Liam Bates. And then uh, we'll we'll a little bit about the our ongoing and relatively new podcast on in intelligent buildings, followed by a white paper subcommittee update, some new business, and some announcements announcements of. Uh, past events and upcoming events that are applicable to, to the space. So with, with that, I'll pass it off to, to you, Bob, to go over about the IBC. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we do have a packed agenda today. Pretty exciting stuff. I'm looking forward to, uh, to our keynote. Uh, so with that, I would like to call the meeting to order uh, and thank everyone for participating. Um, the minute from last uh, from last month's or last quarter's meeting uh, are posted on the kava.org forward slash IBC page. Uh, so if someone would like to please uh, make a uh, motion to accept those uh, notes for minutes. Would someone like to come off mute and uh, make a motion to approve the minutes? So moved, uh, Ken Wax. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, would anyone like to second that? <clears throat> Charlie Dirk from Lagrand. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, are there any opposed? Hearing none opposed, the motion passes and the minutes are approved. Thank you thank all you for all. that. Um, now I'll pass it back off to you, Greg, to talk about uh, a call for board members. Yeah, I'll just be brief here. So we have uh, uh, the following companies you see on the screen here are the organizations that uh, essentially guide and direct what we do as an organization at CABA, uh, representing OEM manufacturers, service providers, solution providers at uh, both residential and large building. And uh, we have 21 companies on the board right now, and we're looking to increase this to, to 25. So if, uh, if your company uh, or yourself would be interested in, in joining and being on the board, um, uh, please feel free to send me an email at walker at and I can uh, set up a separate call to go over some of the responsibilities that's uh, involved in being on the board of directors. So the board is... The board seat is for the company, and and then the company would uh, elect an individual as a representative, and uh, we would do two in-person meetings a year and a virtual one and some other sort of task force meetings uh, throughout the year, depending on uh, what's going on and 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 what's needed. Um, so with that, if, if there's any interest, uh, please feel free to to contact me uh, at walker.cabot.org, or you can just uh, put your name in the chat and, and I'll, I'll reach out. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. What a great opportunity for uh, companies to really brand themselves and be a part of the intelligent building industry with you know, a lot of peers that are uh, 
real innovators and movers and shakers. So, uh, super opportunity. Uh, I believe Greg, are you going to stick with us and do the uh, and help us out with the research update? Sure, sure. Yeah. So we're doing. Uh, so as you know, we do these landmark research projects uh, every year. So this is the one that uh, uh, last year's project took a little bit longer to do. We completed this this year. Uh, and uh, essentially, it looks at just this topic uh, that that the keynote presentation is on. So indoor, as uh, our healthy buildings, then indoor environmental quality with a focus on air quality as well. Uh, this one was done by Harbor Research, and uh, it's around a hundred thousand dollar research project where you can see the funders that uh, that chipped in either uh, five, ten, or fifteen thousand dollars to to join the research and to shape the research. Most of them on the on the steering committee to determine who, who gets surveyed, what are the questions going to look like, and uh, and what are the what are the specific topics around indoor environmental quality that the project is going to address. So we we have an executive summary we can share out to, to we, we can share it in the minutes after the after the call to anyone that's uh, uh, the, anyone that registered and uh, if you want more information feel free to to reach out. If we go to the next slide here. Um, this one is uh, our our current uh, research project that we're looking at. Uh, there's no title right now, so we're, it's a. Uh, it's an intelligent building landmark research project, and we're doing a, a, a there was a couple of bids back in from uh, some research firms, and we're going to be doing those selections uh, tomorrow to determine uh, these, are the, these are the initial funders on the project, and we're going to decide uh, which bid and which proposal we're going to go forward with, and we'll have a little bit more information on on the topic and the scope and uh, and a timeline uh, shortly for anyone that, that's interested in joining these projects. So this is a, another sort of crowdfunded research project uh, that we'll be, we'll be doing this year and completing it in, in Q4 this year is most likely. Uh, go to the next slide. So, uh, this is the, the final the final research project through the, through the IBC, and uh, we have we're, we're doing a market sizing research project on building automation control systems, looking at some software, some hardware, some controllers from various different organizations that are contributing uh, um, essentially sales data, and we are anonymizing that and providing them. Uh, um, the aggregate uh, data and the ag aggregate numbers so they can determine market share. So we'll have, a, there's one more company that will be joining this uh, fairly soon and, and about uh, hopefully hopefully this week. And uh, so we have a good group of control companies that are on board. So this is a invitation only uh, research project, but just here to give you an update of some of the work that uh, the IBC is continuing to do in, on the research front. Great. Thank you for that, uh, Greg. Appreciate that overview. Again, another great opportunity to get involved in the, in the research and, uh, and be a part of, of that educational portion of what we do. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Liam Bates. Uh, he's the CEO, and Liam, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Katera? Is that how you say it? Uh, yeah, Katera. That's right. Katera, all right. Great. And today, uh, you're going to be talking about indoor air quality, or IAQ, uh, which is crucial when it comes to healthy energy-saving buildings. And when interpreted correctly, IAQ data can be powerful, a powerful tool to reduce energy consumption, lower maintenance costs, and extend the life cycle of utilities in buildings, while ensuring the safety and comfort of its occupants. Fortunately, when it comes to IAQ, monitor and proof technology has joined the smart revolution. This means that keeping the quality of indoor environment optimal can become an automated process, freeing up key resources and leaving nothing to chance. Today's keynote will focus on the parameters to measure and track, uh, why you should take an automated data-driven approach to your building, and how to harness the power of IEQ data to turn insight into action. Liam Bates is the founder and CEO of Kitera, a global leader in air quality monitoring solutions, a seasoned expert on air quality, sensor technology, IoT, and BAS slash BMS. Liam oversees product development and research and development at Katera. Liam has been nominated as the IWBI advisor in both performance and air concept. He frequently speaks at international conferences and exhibitions on air quality and monitoring solutions, including IAQA annual meeting. Liam, great to have you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then uh, we'll hopefully have some time to field some questions after. 
Absolutely. And uh, yeah, th thank you very much. I will try to share my screen now and hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties. Should be good to go, Liam, whenever you, you can grab it. Okay. So just a uh, quick confirmation, you're seeing this, um, the first slide up, is that right? Yeah. That's correct. Perfect. Okay. Uh, great. Well, thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction. Um, I guess there's, there's not too much that I have to add. Uh, CEO and co-founder at Kaitera. And uh, just uh, hello to a lot of the people on this call. I see a lot of familiar names, uh, a lot of good friends. So uh, good to see those people and um, uh, all the new faces as well. So maybe just a little bit of, of, of background about why IAQ uh, and sort of the, the story that, that brought Kaitara into existence. So uh, in, in 2014, I was at the time spending, spending some time in Beijing in China, a city which is known for its pristine indoor uh, and outdoor air quality. <laughs> and th that year was particularly bad with, with, with smog. It was, it was pretty unbearable. And just as somebody in the city, I was personally trying to understand what is the what is the air quality in my home? Am I safe when when I'm at home? And I talked to a lot of a lot of friends and and colleagues and people that I knew that had air purifiers, and just asking them the question: How how do you know that the air in your home is safe to breathe? And is your air good or is your air bad? And uh, what I found was that really nobody had nobody had any idea. the The answers were. Uh, I think it's probably pretty good or uh, um, seems seems like it's not great. Uh, and unfortunately, that's very that's very similar to what we have in the the vast majority of buildings and commercial buildings around the planet today. Um, if you if you go into pretty much any building, the odds are that no one is going to be able to give you a scientific data based answer uh, about whether or not the air quality in this building is acceptable. Um, Perhaps they'll be they'll be pulling from um, a, a data point that was that was uh, taken three months ago. Uh, maybe they'll look at the engineer drawings and say, well, according to the way that the building was was built, theoretically we should have good air quality. But very few buildings today can actually tell you at this minute in this part of the building the air is good or bad, and that seems problematic to me. It seemed problematic when it was my own home, and uh, that was really sort of the spark that. Um, that got us started with Kaitera is trying to answer that question. How, how can how can we make sure that the the air inside our indoor spaces uh, is good and we actually know what those readings are? So it's been a long journey since then and uh, uh, a lot of learnings along the way, which hopefully I'll share uh, some of with you today. So just quickly about Kaitera, we uh, are an end-to-end -end air quality optimization platform. So we create hardware like you see in this slide, uh, beautiful monitors that you can place inside buildings, some with screens, some without. So these are hardware sensors that are capturing air quality data. That data is then being sent to the building management system, to the cloud. There's a, a system of uh, software analytics platform to help you make sense of the vast amount of data. So a, a building could typically generate one to two billion data points a year, which is a lot of data that needs to be organized and processed and managed and made sense of. Uh, and then ultimately people, essentially experienced professionals that can also come in and help the, the, the end user to interpret that data. Our solutions are found in a lot of the, the world's most iconic buildings from the Empire State Building, Burj Khalifa, and a lot of other very beautiful, very tall buildings all around the world. So a little bit of what we will be uh, going through today, there's sort of four parts to this. Number one is uh, just kind of focusing on the the fundamentals of, of healthy buildings. And uh, then we'll get really into, into indoor air quality IAQ and how to make sense of that data. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the ROI of this and, and the value that IAQ data can, can bring. Uh, and finally, we'll share some case studies and best practices. Uh, and maybe before jumping further into this, um, I would, and I'm not sure if I, if everybody is able to to type in the chat, but uh, if so, it would be great just to get an idea of everybody's familiarity level with with indoor air quality. So, if you are able to to type in the chat, maybe put a put a five, you know, on a scale from one to five. Five is is I know everything about indoor air quality. One is, you know, I don't really know much. Give me the basics. 
Uh, and I'd love to just get sort of a, uh, a picture of where everyone's knowledge is with regards to indoor air quality. Saying two, three, four, three, three point five, three, two. Uh, got Bernard with five. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. We've got a we've got a wide range here, uh, and I feel like I know all the I know all the fives. <laughs> um, wonderful. Okay, thank you, thank you for that quick that quick feedback. So first of all, let's let's go over some some basics. Um, healthy buildings, or just health and wellness, is incredibly important. And within the built environment, indoor air quality is really at, at the the foundations of this. Uh, a lot of this, of course, over the past few years with with COVID nineteen, we heard a whole lot about indoor air quality, uh, but. The trends around IAQ are one of those trends that are here to stay. A lot of things with with uh, maybe COVID leaving the the forefront of what everyone's thinking about every day. Uh, a, a lot of pandemic driven trends have sort of receded. Work from home seems to be one of those trends that has not disappeared. Many people are still working from home, from home, and IAQ is another one of those. Really, the importance around indoor air quality. Uh, IAQ has never been more important than it is right now. There's a lot of uh, a lot of information. There's a lot of uh, news. There's a lot of action being taken from the White House having an indoor air quality summit to uh, recent updates to uh, or drafts with with ASHRAE uh, to a whole lot of other conferences that are suddenly uh, popping up all around the indoor environment. And one of the big drivers here as well is, and, and this is just from the conversations that we're having within the commercial building space, there is a huge drive to get people back into offices. There's a huge drive because that that's where some of the magic happens in in uh, in work. But to get people back from their house into the office can be a really big challenge. And one of the most effective ways to do that is to have an amazing office. And so, <clears throat> and I'm sure I'm, I'm telling, telling you what a lot of people here are already hearing or already familiar with, the importance of having a world-class working environment and a world-class office is more important than it ever was before. There's been a big shift in buildings to go from being dull and undistinguished to being incredibly desirable because that's something that is going to um, bring people into these spaces. And IAQ is a, a core piece of that, as we'll get into in a second. So this is, this is one of my favorite quote, quotes. It's from uh, uh, Dr. Joe Allen. In the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, workplaces need fresh air, not foosball tables and coffee bars. We spent the past maybe 20 years seeing all sorts of uh, coffee bars pop up in, in office spaces, uh, 25 flavors of cappuccino and uh, you know, 13 different colors of beanbag chairs. But at the end of the day, what people really care about is being healthy in their spaces, feeling happy, feeling productive, getting good work done, being able to go home feeling energized. And the reality is that that doesn't come from the, uh, you know, the, the beanbag chairs. It comes from having a healthy space that makes you feel good. And there is an incredible amount of evidence pointing to the benefit on your health from having a positive uh, indoor air quality. So, so, so what's, you know, what is a healthy building? A healthy building is basically just a commercial, residential, or public building, which was designed in a way to promote the health, safety, and well-being of the people inside it. Uh, this is really bringing together principles and insights from engineering, construction, medicine, psychology, and of course, technology uh, to create a space that is able to promote health. This is a little bit different. We're often talking about uh, green buildings, sustainable buildings. Uh, that's more about, I'd say, the, the, the health of the planet. Uh, when we're talking about healthy buildings, we're really talking about the health of the people inside. Though there is, there is obviously a, a massive overlap between, between these, these, these two areas. I say the foundations of a healthy building. This is there's there's a list of nine foundations here that are often often quoted. Um, really, the first two are, are are the ones we'll be focusing on: ventilation and and air quality. Um, without getting too into the weeds, because we we have limited time today, there's a lot of studies pointing to the the benefit of indoor air quality on uh, employee satisfaction. Uh, for example, a study conducted in the Netherlands. 
there was a 70% of a company's workforce was relocated into a different building, which had better perceived environmental conditions, and air quality had the largest effect on reducing employee dissatisfaction. Uh, similarly, 82% of recently surveyed millennials would say that they would feel much safer returning to the office if they could receive timely and transparent indoor air quality data. There's a lot of research from Honeywell as well pointing to uh, uh, similar trends there. So what, what, what is IAQ when we're talking about indoor air quality? What are, what are we really talking about? There are many, many, many different things um, within the air that we breathe. And we breathe a huge amount of, of air every day. So there are a lot of different compounds, but usually we're talking about a relatively short list. And uh, these, are, these are some of them. So without getting too into the weeds, I'll just give you a, a brief sort of breakdown. Uh, PM 2.5 or PM particulate matter in general is referring to very, very fine particles in the air. And I, and I, I know the, the, uh, the people that wrote five in the chat just now will be going, wow, why are you telling me this? But we've also got We've got everything from one to five, so <laughs> bear with me. <clears throat> so particulate matter, extremely fine particles, essentially fine, very, very, very fine dust in the air. And when you breathe this in, it's so small that it, it, it will not get stopped by your, uh, your nose, your throat, or actually even the cell wall of your lungs. So it, there's the potential for these small particles to travel really into the, the human bloodstream, uh, be transported around the body and have very significant uh, impacts both on your short-term health and well-being and how you feel as well as long-term. TVOC is um, volatile organic compounds or total volatile organic compounds. These are essentially a wide range of compounds given off by uh, a variety of sources within the built environment, uh, some, sometimes human, but also very, very often um, materials. So carpets, paint, glue. And these chemicals have a, a, a wide range of impacts on our health, but potentially can have very negative impacts again, both on the short and long term. CO2 is one that everyone's probably very familiar with. We are, we're, we're creating CO2 all the time as we, as we exhale. Uh, but of course, elevated levels of CO2 have negative impact on how we feel. Uh, generally not life-threatening unless you are exposed to incredibly high levels of CO2. But we, we've all had that feeling of being in a conference room and it just feels stuffy and you want to get out of it and you think I need some fresh air. And that's often a result of CO2 as well as uh, VOCs being too high. We've got ozone listed here. This is more of an outdoor pollutant, uh, but can find its way into the, the inside of buildings um, and uh, can be of concern depending on where you live and where, where the building is. And temperature and humidity, these are sometimes thought of more as com comfort metrics or thermal comfort, but of course do have a, a very big impact on how we feel. Often the, the subjective feelings that we have within a space is actually a, a complex mix of all of these things being slightly out of alignment. For example, levels of CO2 are too high, VOC is a bit high, maybe uh, humidity levels have gone up, the temperature is uh, one degree too high, and it just leads to this overall feeling of uncomfortableness. So I'll take a brief sip of water before we jump into the collection of IAQ. So this is a quote you've probably heard 10,000 times in every PowerPoint before, but it, it, it's true. You can only improve what you measure. There is there's simply no way to improve indoor air quality effectively unless you're actually taking measurements of it. So if we can all agree that indoor air quality is something that we believe is important, which I think the scientific evidence is very, very clear on that. And we want to improve this, we want to manage this, then fundamentally we need to start with measuring. Now, how do we measure indoor air quality? Traditionally, the, the I'd say the, the, the old school way of doing this um, <clears throat> is through air quality spot checks. And this is really a, a this was the best option that was available at the time. Uh, and the reason for this is, is, as I was describing at the very start of this presentation, when I started, when I was trying to answer the, 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 the question of, is the air in my house acceptable to breathe? There was no easy answer. The only way that I could answer that question was by going and finding, going to a university finding research equipment, uh, borrowing it for the weekend and taking it home. And it's not realistic for a building to have 
$30,000 of equipment that is sort of mounted on the walls all the time, you know, $30,000 per room, that's, that's not a viable solution. Um, and so really the only option that we had in the past was to have somebody come in this typically a, an, ex, an external third party, maybe come in once per year, every six months, take a few measurements throughout the building, write them down on a piece of paper and um, use that to state whether the air in this building was good or bad. There are a lot of problems with this approach. Again, this was just uh, uh, the, the best option that was available at the time, but times have changed. Technology has changed, and there's a whole lot more that we can do, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, now, of course, you know, this, the, I'm talking here to a group of people who, who are thinking about uh, automation in buildings all the time. So this is probably sounding like a very, very backwards uh, approach. Now, some of the problems with, with uh, this kind of methodology is that you're, you, you only have a couple, maybe two, three, four data points throughout a building. And of course, we know that buildings are not the same all the way throughout. Buildings that have rooms that have more people will have higher levels of CO2. Uh, rooms that are you know, areas that are directly under the, um, the supply duct will probably also have better air than areas that are stagnant and in a corner where the air isn't being circulated. So it doesn't make sense to just have a couple of readings. It also makes it extremely hard to understand the trends and patterns and, and how spaces change over time. The reality is that air quality is not a flat metric. It changes just as temper temperature changes throughout the day. When the sun is shining on the building, the temperature in an area goes up more than in another area. When it's a cloudy day, if it's snowing, these all have an impact and it's the same with air quality. And, and this is kind of an example of what um, what, what you'd often see in a project where looking at kind of the first stage of, of a building's existence, which is construction, and typically the air is not very good during, during the construction of a building. There's dust, there are chemicals. Then the building gets flushed out and it, there's, there's all this beautiful, bright, you know, wonderful clean air that's brought into the space. And if you take a measurement at this point in time, it seems like you have a wonderful building and everything, everything's great. Uh, the problem is that people, people then enter this building and those, those readings are going to look potentially very, very different. Uh, so during the occupancy phase, when you actually have people interacting with the building, when the HVAC system is running in the way that it was, it was designed to, uh, you might have a very different picture. So depending on where on this x-axis you choose to take your measurements, you've got a very different picture of how well the building performs. That's of course why it's important to have continuous monitoring. And I, I realize I'm preaching to the choir here probably. Um, Technology now enables us to take readings every single second, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That allows us to understand trends and be able to be able to extract trends and see patterns, understand how one floor performs differently from another floor, understand that this HVAC zone is performing worse than that HVAC zone. And that allows us to understand what the root causes of problems are. And incredibly importantly, allows us to start automating some of these processes. So if CO2 levels are constantly too high in this area, then of course we can deliver more, more fresh air. Um, getting a little bit more complicated, we can do the same thing with, with all those other parameters, PM 2.5, TVOC, uh, and so on. So maybe just the, the, the last point here before kind of jumping into the next section. So some key considerations for choosing an IAQ monitor. I think it's, it, it, and this is something I'm happy to talk about with anybody here if, uh, later if, if there are any questions. Um, there are a lot of different options for measuring indoor air quality on the market right now. And I think it's really important to um, be very clear about so what, the, what the goals are before jumping into a project, because there are a lot of different ways to accomplish those goals. And um, certainly when it comes to things like automation, what type of connectivity is being used? Uh, one of the one of the challenges with with indoor air quality is that some some of the outcomes can be automated. So, for example, CO two levels are too high, bring in more fresh air, demand control ventilation, very straightforward. But some can be much more complicated. For example, uh, all of all of the conference rooms uh, in this building perform slightly worse than other types of rooms. Well, that's that's not necessarily something that can be adjusted through automation, but actually requires insight that is delivered to a human. And so what we found is really there's out of indoor air quality data, there's one set of outcomes that can be essentially given to a building management system. 
and change can be made automatically in the other system. The, 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 the other output of that is really coming up with a set of clear steps that can be given to a facility manager or a similar role so that changes can be made in the building that require some sort of human intervention. And it's really when you hit both of these that you get to those amazing uh, outcomes. I'll just jump jump through this section uh, quickly and make sure we've got a few minutes for the case studies. When you're looking at anything, there's um, fundamentally any any sort of solution should be able to either add more value or reduce costs or increase time. Right? This is just sort of the fundamentals of of calculating ROI. So, how does this tie into air quality? I, I said at the start of this presentation that there is a very there's a lot of data that is able to uh, tell us conclusively that improved air quality leads to improved performance, uh, in increased happiness from the occupants of a space. Uh, here is, for example, there, there's there are many data points like this that I could go on for for several minutes. But just to give you one, uh, every 400 ppm increase in CO2 leads to a productivity drop of 21%. Uh, this is again coming from uh, some research from the. Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And so just if you've ever, ever been into a meeting room and it feels, you just feel horrible in there, it's not uncommon to see meeting rooms that are that have 2,000 ppm of CO2. So, so they're sort of about 1,500 higher than, than they should be. And uh, if you do the math on here, you can start to see why your, your productivity seems to fall, fall off of a cliff. So healthy indoor air quality can boost tenant satisfaction. And this has a lot of long-term benefits. Uh, there's also a, a huge potential impact on energy savings. Um, and again, I know a lot of people on this call are, are, are experts in, in this, but HVAC accounts for almost half of the energy consumption within the typical building. And the amount of energy that we see wasted due to Misconceptions around indoor air quality is absolutely insane. Uh, I can list a number of buildings where we're able, able to identify 25, 30, 35 percent potential energy savings uh, simply by measuring indoor air quality and taking some very, very simple steps to optimize how air is being delivered to different parts of the building. I mean, the 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 the, the example that everyone can. Uh, sort of identify with them, have probably seen themselves is when you find that the, the, the HVAC system is running on the weekend and there's nobody in the building, or you find that uh, only the first floor of the building is occupied and the, the top seven floors are having cool, you know, wonderful conditioned air being delivered to them at uh, uh, an incredible rate. So the, the first step in identifying any of these possible and potential optimizations is to measure, to make sense of the data, and then an incredible number of optimizations when it comes to energy savings uh, suddenly find their way to the surface. Uh, again, happy to share more during the, the Q&A if there are questions about that. So we'll just jump into some of the, the case studies, and uh, then we'll move on to the Q&A after that. So this is this is one example that I, I um, personally resonate with very much because I, I live very close to Seattle. Um, so Microsoft's offices in Seattle they they used our technology, they used a combination of indoor air quality monitors as well as outdoor air quality monitors to measure what is going on and understand fundamentally how the building is performing. How how well is it actually filtering outdoor air? Now, Seattle is a very, and it's, at this point, unfortunately, it's the entire West Coast of North America, um, but is, is, is in, well, actually this year, not so much the West Coast. It's, it's really creeping to everything except the East Coast at this point, I'd say, uh, which is issues with wildfires. So much of the continent has amazing air quality for 95, 98% of the year. Uh, but then there is probably one or two weeks where the air quality is, is the, the worst in the world. Uh, we recently see, saw a lot of Canada was exposed to wildfires and for, for quite a while was you know, outranking anywhere in Asia, outranking New Delhi, outranking Beijing in terms of uh, the world's worst air quality. And th this is, this is a, a, a unique and complicated situation because 
for the vast majority of the time, you have you have wonderful air quality, but for a little while, you need to deal with the worst air quality in the world. So how do you do that? Well, in, in, in this case, Microsoft um, is able to look at what is happening inside, what's happening outside. And in this, in this particular example, it's very interesting because they also have a number of buildings. So they can, they can actually start to see smoke making its way across the campus. And you can start to understand that in 30 minutes, this building, the outdoor environment will be covered in smoke. And that means that right now, what we need to do is bring an absolute maximum of fresh air into the building. And then 30 minutes from now, we need to close the dampers and we need to be recirculating much more than we typically would. Now, there's some challenges here that you need to balance about how, how do we weigh the impact of outdoor particulate matter versus increased levels of CO2. Um, but but there are, I think, straightforward ways to answer that question. And at a time like this, it, it, that, that's where it becomes, it's, it's really the opportunity for a building to shine. Uh, when the entire city is uh, covered in smoke and you can say that our building is performing well and actually you will feel good, you will feel happy in this space. Uh, so no, no joke, I've actually seen some buildings where they've done a really, really good job of this. And uh, on the West Coast, people will bring their families in on the weekend because they're not able to keep the air in their home as as clean as they should or as, as they would like to. And I mean, that's it's an unfortunate reality, but it says a lot about the type of workplace and the type of building that you have when your employees bring their families into the office to hang out because it is the best environment that they can find in the entire city. Uh, these are just some examples here of um, the, the kind of the, the, the software that would be used to help understand some of the some of the trends. So making sense of a large amount of data and saying, okay, uh, this specific meeting room on Thursdays typically has a problem. And this is what would be used sort of as insights uh, to start making changes in the space. So another example here, uh, this case study from uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico. So they had a quite a large um, uh, revamp of their HVAC systems. So this was about $1.4 million project. And uh, they introduced a lot of new technology from, uh, from, from UV to uh, portable purifiers to increasing the, the rating of the, the MERV filters. And in order to make sure that they were taking the right steps in uh, and using the, the, the right types of technology, they also installed uh, Kaitara's air quality monitors throughout the space. And this helped them to really make sense and understand, is this technology for this specific space doing the job that we thought it would? And we also see this a lot with schools where before taking some technology and ramp, sort of installing it through every corner of every building, you probably want to make sure that the technology is performing as you expect and doing the job that, that you think it should. Um, it's not every technology will perform in the way that you want in the specific space that you have. And so the first step is really understanding, does this work? Uh, and then scaling that out rather than starting with a, a huge project and then realizing that maybe maybe it wasn't the right, the right choice for your, your campus. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I, I know there's also a lot of partners on 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 this call who, who've uh, uh, worked with the Alliance Center before. So the Alliance Center is a, a co-working space and it's an event, uh, an event venue and a an environmental nonprofit that's based in uh, Denver, Colorado. And so we did a lot of work with them to help them optimize filtration, optimize uh, how the spaces were being managed. And again, this is this is an, an interesting challenge where this is both during COVID when everyone's saying, ventilate, 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 bring in as much fresh air as possible. But at the same time, they also have to deal with uh, wildfires around Colorado. And so juggling that that balance between bringing in more, well, it really isn't fresh air at this point. It's just air with low levels of CO2 and high levels of particulate matter. Uh, and, and trying to, to juggle those two is very challenging. Now, in this case, um, we we were able to tell from the the data that an entire section of the building had some pretty severe issues with TVOC. Uh, those were identified, those were resolved, and this data was made public for the occupants. So anybody in the building could uh, could view that. 
And they were also doing a lot of research around the impact um, uh, of being able to share this data with occupants. So that research isn't isn't public yet, um, but it was it was that was a major part of this as well. Was saying we're not we are not just measuring air quality data. We are measuring it, being transparent about it, communicating it, and really helping to facilitate a return to office and uh, return to work. It's also really important, and this is kind of the, the, the final note here, it's, it's really important to be able to um, turn all of this data into clear next steps. Uh, so rather than just throwing a whole bunch of data at people, really being able to say, here are all the different things that you could do to, to change, to change the space. Now, some of those can be automated. Let's go automate the ones that can, and that would typically be, well, there's, I, well, you can talk in a moment more about how that would be done. Um, but uh, automate the ones that can and the ones that, re that require some sort of human in intervention or human interaction. Rank those in terms of, in order of how much value they will be able to deliver to the space and how much they'll be able to improve the space. And so that's sort of what you see on the screen here where every building has a lot of different problems and it's really about working out what is the one that will have the most impact? What is the highest ROI? Uh, and then... Uh, starting from the top and working your way down. We've seen, we've seen some examples recently where the, the, the biggest impact on the space was th simply through putting a sign on certain spaces that said that after the meeting was over to leave the door ajar. Uh, <laughs> and this is, of course, due to a space not being as well ventilated, not being as well designed as it potentially could have been. But the options were, let's redo our entire mechanical systems or let's put a sign on the door that says maybe you know, leave it open for a few minutes at the end of a meeting. And they'll both have the same effect. <laughs> and so you can see from, from, the, from the end user perspective, uh, this was a, the, the difference in ROI between those two solutions was orders of magnitude different. And um, so, I mean, that's just, a, I think, a, a very simple, simple example. I see some questions coming in. So uh, I think we can move over to uh, Q&A. Um, Great. Well, thanks, Liam. I appreciate that. Very, uh, very insightful. Uh, I was a, a two and a half on your scale, so, and, I, and I learned some stuff today. I appreciate that. Uh, Perfect. A couple Thank of questions you. that came in. Uh, one, in the design phase, uh, where and how do you locate the IAQ monitors? Yes, I mean, that is a... That's that's a big question that we could we could have a whole hour long discussion on that. Um, but I think at, at the very the very basics is that you want IAQ monitors to be within what we would call the breathing zone, which is typically sort of three to six feet. It's where people are breathing because that's the air that you care about. You also want them to be typically wall mounted, but not next to any source of ventilation. So you you don't want to place one of these directly under the supply duct, for example. Um, we try to keep them on the other side of the room. So it's it's really trying to find uh, the the air that is most representative of the air that's being being breathed by the by by the people inside. That's the short answer. So, oh, that, that's very helpful too. So I understand right through the presentation that you'd want one in any enclosed space. So conference rooms would all have to would want their own monitor in each conference room, and then you have uh, oftentimes a big open area with cubicles. Do you only need one sensor for an, you know a fifty by fifty area or Sometimes in some of these open areas, you need multiple. Yeah, great question. Uh, so, it really the the this, this sort of short answer is that it depends on the space. And so, typically, like if if we are actually working on a project with with a client, then we will sit down and look at the floor plans with them and help them to make the 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 best decisions. Uh, because it does depend a little bit on the architecture. So, yes. Typically, you would want to have one per enclosed space. Um, now, obviously, if there's sort of budgetary constraints, another good option is to try to find one per representative space. So, for example, if you have five conference rooms that are all the same size, that are all side by side, then you might be able to get away with using one as kind of a proxy to understand how that type sure. of space performs in general. But it's not; is it is definitely not perfect. Um, but large large open areas, you you probably get. I'd say if you go with sort of the, the the well recommendations, which are what we typically go with, you're probably looking at one monitor per 3,500 uh, square hmm. feet. Oh, great. That's great insight. Thank you for, for sharing that. 
Um, you, with the increase in higher MERV and HEPA filters that cause more uh, pressure loss and energy, but what about electronic and smart air, air filters that use less energy and tell you when they need to be replaced? And I'm gonna couple that with, uh, does that help with smaller PM like 0.3, things like COVID that obviously is still in the back of everyone's mind? Yes. Um, okay. So this, I mean, I think there's a lot of different answers to this question. Um, and the, the, that's one of the challenges with air quality is that it's, we're often looking for a sort of a, like a one size fits all answer, but as we have seen, it can be very, very different. So what you would do in New Delhi, where outdoor levels of PM are very, very high is completely different to what you would do in New York, for example. Um, and as we just saw in the comments as well, in, in Calgary, <laughs> you probably wouldn't do the same thing there either. So the best solution really depends on a lot of factors, including what, is out, what, do, what does outdoor air pollution look like in the area? Uh, some places will benefit more. And also what are the mechanical systems in the building? Like how, how much air can be delivered and how well can it be filtered? Uh, how much does it need to be recir recirculated? How much can it be recirculated? Uh, the, these all have, have an impact. Uh, there are situations in where portable purifiers are going to be a much better solution. If, for example, you have, so just to, to kind of give, give a concrete example here, if you have a building that is not that well sealed and where you're not able to deliver that much air into the space, then what's going to happen is that you're going to have infiltration of pollutants from outdoors onto the inside. And you're just not able to deliver enough clean air, filtered air to mitigate that. So you're gonna to want to use something like a portable purifier. Uh, if your building is able to deliver a huge amount of clean air, so filtered air and potentially positively pressurize the space, then that's going to be a, a, a different answer as well. So it it, <laughs> it, it, it depends a lot and um, on geography as well as other factors. Sure, a lot of unknowns to be answering some of these questions, that very building specific based questions for sure. Uh, but here's, here's a question that kind of might tie in things a little bit better. The, what I what I liked about the, some of the things you talked about was you're, you're giving actionable results. Hey, this is where you are. This is a suggestion how, how that needs to be. So how do we take that uh, IAQ data and turn it into building control? Does, is it a direct tie-in or does that have to go to a building operator who then makes a decision to change the controls of the building? I think there are a few different ways to, to do this. And there's... So the, the way that I think we typically see this is, is there's kind of three different outputs from any type of indoor air quality data. There is that which can be sent, sort of used directly for automation. So levels of, for example, outdoor levels of PM 2.5 are too high, close the dampers and stop bringing in outdoor air. You know, that, that, is, that is something that can be automated. We've seen that automated. Um, and that's that's relatively straightforward. Then there are also outputs that require a uh, a building operator sort of in, in the middle because it's too complex, or it, for example, it might require uh, a filter to be changed. Um, so you know that that's something that we'll see as well. Is that let's say the second floor of the building is filtering air better than the third floor of the building, and uh, you know that can be tied to when filters were changed, were they changed correctly, uh, et cetera. So, so you need to bring in another person there. And then there's a, a sort of a third output, which is more going to the design teams and the real estate planning teams. And that's often around um, longer term changes that need to be made. So, and, and we'll see this where, for example, um, you know, recently, a lot of companies have found that they need to they used to have large open open office areas, but now in 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 the office, everybody's on Zoom calls because half the people are working from home. And that means that you need more meeting rooms. And so meeting rooms were built, but ventilation was not provided to said meeting rooms or they aren't they aren't performing as as expected. And so that's sort of a, a longer term change. Um, so <clears throat> not sure if I entirely answered your question there. There's really kind of three outputs. One of those is automation. We've seen a lot of different flavors of automation from this data. Great. So yeah, so there, there's, it's a kind of a hybrid approach. Some things are going to take a physical operator, other things we can automate a bit. Um, yeah. And uh, the bottom line is making the difference. 
So uh, last uh, question here, I'm gonna tie two questions in together. I feel they're, they're similar enough. Um, because uh, 03 is more so of an outdoor uh, issue than it is indoor, how useful is indoor O3 measurement on a continuous basis? And really the same question for radon, is there a purpose for uh, ongoing uh, continuous radon monitoring? Sure, yeah, okay. So um, O3, well, so O3 is typically an outdoor pollutant. That said, over the past few years, there's, there's been a lot of concern about the introduction of uh, technologies into the building that have the potential to create ozone. So uh, unfortunately, these are these are often sort of marketed as air cleaning or air purifying technologies, um, which is, is, is debatable and unfortunately can also result in uh, the creation of ozone within the space. So that's that's one area where we've seen a a, a need for ozone measurement is that I've installed technology X and I want to be sure that it is not, uh, there's no negative byproducts from that. Um, in terms of measuring outdoor ozone, I'd say the vast majority of buildings do not require this. Usually by the time that ozone makes its way through the mechanical systems as well, it will already have, have been broken down. Uh, but we have seen, we have seen buildings in certain areas that are, and, and these are just sort of geographical areas where typically you can see higher levels of outdoor ozone and it can be valuable there because again, it's similar to PM 2.5. If you, if you lower the amount of outdoor air that's being brought into the space, then you'll be lowering the ozone. Uh, radon, I think is, uh, I, I would ag agree with, with that statement. It's something that is incredibly important to measure, but uh, the value of continuous monitoring is going to be a lot lower there uh, because it's, it's really sort of a, a background um, a background measurement, and you also definitely don't need to have this in every room of the building or anything like that. That's uh, that's that's a lot of wasted measurement. Awesome. Well, Liam, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your time today, sharing your insights on uh, indoor air quality uh, and some of the measures we can take to make uh, our buildings uh, even healthier. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing. As you can see, if anybody has uh, other questions that, that weren't answered, I think there's some things in the comments. Uh, you can find me on, on, on LinkedIn or uh, send me a message over there. I'll be happy to chat further. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks again. Awesome. Next up, uh, podcast. Chris, are you there? I don't think Chris Larry is on the call, Bob. He yeah. might not okay. be. Okay, I could uh, I could take over. That's not would a you problem. Like to? Okay, Mara. of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we have actually a couple uh, podcast participants on the call, if I'm not mistaken. But um, so uh, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard uh, on on previous calls, um, Kaba has started uh, its own podcast series. Um, we've already done a few episodes now. I think we're on our seventh or eighth episode, um, and what. Uh, was supposed to be quarterly has now become uh, a monthly podcast series uh, just because of all the interest that it's um, it's gaining. Um, our most recent podcast, um, there was actually two in May, uh, one on uh, intelligent buildings and cybersecurity issues, and then um, as well on uh, POE lighting and, and uh, IoT uh, in buildings. Uh, and actually, uh, Kim Johnson from MHT uh, is on the call right now. She participated in that one. Um, so if, uh, if, if there is any interest from anyone on the call who would like to participate um, either as a guest or a host, and actually Bob Allen, our Bob Allen, our chair here, um, who's done a few already, uh, um, and I believe you have a couple scheduled uh, to uh, coming up. Um, so if you are interested in being a guest or a host, um, please let me know. You can uh, reach me uh, on the email on the screen there. And uh, just uh, let me know if you're interested. We could do a quick call and I can explain uh, how the whole process works. Um, and then you can also visit our website, cava.org. Um, and go to our podcast section where you can listen to uh, some of our recently recorded episodes. Um, and uh, yeah, so I will, uh, I'll pass it back to you, Bob, if, uh, if you have any Great. comments or if you'd like to pass over. Yeah, no, excellent. I, I will say uh, the uh, doing the podcast are a lot of fun. If there are any uh, subject matter experts or anybody that wants to be a guest and you would like, I, I'm happy to host it for you um, and uh, facilitate that conversation. 
uh, we have many other great hosts that have done a great job and great um, subject matter experts uh, as well. So uh, it's a great, ser great series. Uh, try to be a part of it if you can. Uh, all right, moving along. Uh, Ken, you have an update on the white papers. I do. I am here. Uh, <clears throat> the CAB Intelligent Buildings Council, and for that matter, the Connected Home Council, embarked on a project about 15 years ago to uh, facilitate the creation of innovative white papers by members of the councils. Uh, we've had quite a bit of productivity. Um, the most current white paper at the, Connect at the Intelligent Buildings Council is entitled ADA Compliance in a Smart Technology Environment. Uh, this paper is underway now. The, uh, the chair and author of this uh, working group developing the white paper is Mark Reynolds from the University of New Mexico. And uh, you can see the abstract of the paper there. I'll read it very quickly. The purpose of this white paper is to provide a comprehensive analysis of how smart technologies can enhance the, reason of the, re the reasonable accommodation requirement in the next generation of smart buildings by examining various applications, AI advancements, and interactive smart devices. The aim is to identify solutions that improve the overall experience for individuals with impairments. The focus is to identify existing technologies that either fully or partially meet the reasonable accommodation needs in building designs, catering to small, medium, and large scale implementations. In addition, this paper seeks to explore the functionalities that can facilitate major life activities for people with impairments. By investigating these functionalities, we intend to propose best practices that building owners can adopt to ensure inclusivity and accessibility for all occupants. Lastly, the aim is to establish a rating system that informs occupants about the level of accommodations so they, that they can expect in a particular building. Overall, this uh, white paper aims to foster a deeper understanding of how smart technologies can contribute to creating more inclusive and accessible environments in smart buildings and cities. By identifying and recommending practical solutions and establishing a rating system, we strive to facilitate the adoption of reasonable accommodations, and enhance the overall quality of life for individuals with impairments. So this is ongoing. If you'd like to be involved, uh, please let us know. Uh, we're always looking for uh, additional proposals for white papers. Please uh, contact Marta, contact me. Uh, you can reach me through kenwax.com and you'll find uh, my email and uh, phone. Uh, all the white papers are posted at kaba.org slash white papers. I'll mention uh, just briefly, we also have the Publications Review Committee that uh, makes available to CABA members the latest in published uh, papers from other sources that are relevant in the intelligent uh, building space. So, uh, we have a stringent review process that requires that anything we post and make available to our members is relevant to the field, is not overtly commercial or pushing just one solution, uh, but uh, provide some useful information. So if you have any papers that you think are worthy of telling us about from other sources, whether they are uh, trade press or journal articles. Um, just uh, please contact Marta or contact me. And uh, as a little kicker, we provide a reward of $25 plus $25 in credit for CABA purchases. For those of you that submit a paper from the outside that you found uh, and review the paper, using our review form. Uh, the review form is important to get the parameters of the paper to make sure it's relevant to give your assessment of the paper, to produce a 100 word abstract to the paper and to provide keywords to make searching the CABA library uh, more convenient for visitors. 
So thank you very much. That's the news on white papers we've generated internally and white papers we reviewed from the outside. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate that. Uh, next, moving on to new business. Um, we'd like to make a call out if anyone has any new business that they'd like to discuss. Please feel free to unmute. Um, this could include anything uh, such as new keynote ideas, new white paper ideas, new project discussions, uh, even new agenda items. Any new business at all. Going once, going twice, okay. Um, I'll take this for, uh, for Bob Lane, who's not here. Uh, just some quick announcements. Uh, past events that uh, Kaba has been a part of, uh, there was ISH March 13th through 17th in Germany, IFMA World Workplace March 22nd through 23rd in the Netherlands, uh, IFMA Facilities Fusion April 11th through 13th in San Francisco, and then Light Fair was May 21st through 25th in uh, New York. Some of the up and coming events that uh, Kaba will be a part of is uh, the Real Counter IBCon from the June 14th to June 15th in Las Vegas. Um, Kaba is looking to uh, host their second board meeting of the year at that event. So uh, hopefully our board members will all be present. Uh, and anyone on the call hasn't met board members, uh, I'm sure that um, introductions can be made. Uh, the Shanghai Intelligent Building Technology event is August 29th through 31st in Shanghai. Uh, Bixi is coming up in September 10th through 14th in Las Vegas. And uh, Green Build is September 26th through 29th in DC. Um, if anyone has any events or uh, conferences that uh, we didn't list there that might be relevant, feel free to, to share that with us now. All right. Um, um, uh, sorry, yeah. I just unmuted. David Katz here. So we're um, having the Retrofit Canada Conference. It's in Montreal. Unfortunately, it's on the 13th and 14th, uh, and it's uh, because of the major funding that Canada uh, federal government is giving for deep retrofits, many of which require building automation. And so uh, I do have a discount code, uh, Ontario Sustainable Energy Association, OSEA 20, for those that register at Retrofit Canada, should any of the members want to join. Thanks, David. I appreciate the heads up on that. Can you put that uh, code in the chat for anybody who wants to grab it? Perfect. Great. Well, not hearing anything else. Uh, Greg, anything you want to say to uh, wrap up before I go to adjournment? Uh, no, not anything particular, but if you're, uh, if you're attending uh, RealCon, IBCon, uh, and, and would like to like to to meet uh, definitely uh send me off a quick email and uh, and i can coordinate or if you want to meet any of our our board members as well thanks greg could greg. i yeah again, Hi, David. again i'm on boma doing another webinar on smart building so which hopefully will be recorded um what did the council or the board think about the educational opportunities that were discussed because um I think there's so much opportunity we might do. Is there anything going forward, Greg, that you and I talked about at AHR, et cetera? Uh, well, we're, we're actually putting together, we have an educational task force that, that's set up from with board members. And uh, we're working with a consulting group to basically survey the board members and uh, figuring out one who are we going to be educating and what target audience is it going to be contractors is it going to be installers is it going to be facility managers and figuring out that um that that target one is how are we going to develop these uh programs when the idea is to have one for residential and one for large buildings and and then three we're looking at try to figure out a uh, a rollout model and uh, sort of a monetization model to see about how we can facilitate these, how much is going to cost, um, how who's who's going to be proctoring some of the exams. Are we going to be doing a certification program with the designation at the end? Uh, so there's lots of there's lots of things we're we're working on right now. So I don't, I'm not sure if we can it, it, we don't have anything to roll out at this point, but uh, I think this the soonest we could get something would be probably. Uh, uh, Q4 this year, but uh, we'll see. Okay, but we're well, definitely looking into it. 
just keep me informed because we have some training uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, we've been doing smart building courses now with BIQ. So, okay, thanks. Now, if I All right. Great. Well, then one last announcement here. Uh, the next IBC meeting will be held on Monday, August 21st. First, that'll be the next quarter. So hope um, that you are all back and uh, and bring some others with you as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to close uh, today's meeting. Um, I'd like to make a call up for a motion to close the meeting. If someone could unmute and make that motion. So moved. This is Daryl Carloff. Thank you very much. Anyone for a second? Ken Wax, second. Thank you very much. Are there any opposed? Hearing none opposed, the motion passes. This meeting is adjourned. I uh, hope to see and talk to you all on the 21st.